Hello and welcome to this uh, neuro-ophthalmology talk about uh, oculosympathetic palsy or the Horner syndrome. So to get started we'll just go through the usual disclaimers. So just saying this is health information, it's for learning and for thinking about, it's not for diagnosing or treating any diseases. And if you have any sort of problems, make sure you go see a doctor or some sort of other health professional and to you know, get taken care of. Um, so again, it's just for educational um, purposes only. All right, so uh, getting into the topic here. So the Horner syndrome, the way to think about it in general, and the way that you probably learned or heard about it, was that you have um, a sympathetic pathway lesion. So you have a sympathetic palsy. Eye loses sympathetic innervation, then what happens? So there's three um, main things that are commonly associated with this. Three signs, meiosis, ptosis, and anhydrosis. All right, so the first one, meiosis, what that means is you're going to see, initially you'll see some anisocoria, so the pupils will be um, in different difference in size, and then the side that lost the sympathetic innervation will be smaller than the other side because it's lost the dilator, the innervation, the dilator pupillae uh, muscle, but it still has the parasympathetic um, controlled sphincter pupillae muscle, making the pupil a little bit smaller. All right, and then the second one is ptosis, and it's a mild ptosis because you have loss of innervation to uh, the Mueller muscle, which when you lose that innervation, the, the eyelid will um, drop, drop down a little bit. And then the third one is anhydrosis, which is really a plus or minus thing. It's not always um, part of the picture, but when it is present, it's you lose um, sort of the vasomotor innervation of, of that side of the face near the eye and the ability to sweat over there. All right, and just like there's three um, common signs associated with the oculosympathetic palsy, there's also a three-neuron pathway. And it, this is one where it's actually important to learn the pathway because um, each neuron in a, should, is associated with lesions that are very... Um, dependent on the anatomy, the relevant anatomy. All right, so if you have a first order or a central neuron lesion, that brings up a different differential than if you had a second or a third um, order neuron lesion. And the last point I put here was that it seems, from our initial you know, mention about the meiosis, ptosis, and hydrosis, it seems pretty clinically mild. You know, it's not, um, you, so your pupils a little bit aren't exactly the same size, and you have a tiny bit of, um, droopy eyelid. What, you know, what's the big deal? Well, the reason it can be a big deal is that it can be the initial presentation of um, serious or life-threatening disease. So working up and figuring out uh, what is the cause of the, this Horner syndrome is pretty important and um, could really be beneficial to patients. All right, so the way we're going to approach this is we're going to go over each of the three uh, neurons in this pathway, talk about the sort of reflexive lesions that you should think about occurring there, and then we'll go through the whole um, pathway together, sort of systematically, and then move into how do you work up both pharmacologically um, and with imaging a Horner syndrome. All right, so starting off with first order uh, neurons. First order neuron in this, in this system goes from the posterior hypothalamus to the sympathetic part of the spinal cord, which is the IML to medial lateral column, or horn of the spinal cord. And then it leaves typically around uh, T1 to become the second order, second order neuron. So that's the first synapse hypothalamus down to the IML and the, spi the spinal cord. So as you can tell, hypothalamus, brain stem, spinal cord, this is a central neuron. So CNS type lesions will cause dysfunction here. So that means lesions to the spinal cord, lesions to the brain stem. These can be vascular things, lateral medullary syndrome, they can be tumor, or demyelinating disease. And then just as a general knowledge note, if you're concerned about a, a brain stem lesion, you can ask about the, the D's uh, to try to get if there's any get at any sort of associated uh, brainstem lesion. So the, the D's are the brainstem lesions, or like dysarthria, dysphagia, um, displo diplopia. Horner syndrome is another thing that can be caused by brainstem lesion. All right, so that's the first order neuron, the central neuron in this system. So now we're leaving the, the CNS and we're the, as the second order neuron. So the second order neuron is the preganglionic neuron of this sympathetic um, innervation. And the pathway is from the intermediate lateral column of the, brain, of the um, spinal cord, I should say spinal cord, um, to the superior cervical ganglion. And as we said before, it's the preganglionic nerve. So here, the, the pathway to think about is that it's going to travel in close proximity to the apical pleura and pulmonary disease can cause lesions um, to the second order of nerve. So things to think about are pulmonary carcinoma, like a pancos tumor, as well as head um, and neck surgery.
All right, so now we're, we've moved along from the preganglionic or the second second order neuron to the, sur the superior cervical ganglion, and now we're becoming the third order um, neurons. This travels from the superior cervical ganglion uh, to the target muscles, the dilator pupillary muscle, cellular body, and the Mueller muscle, where we were talking about before. So in terms of anatomy and associated lesions, the thing to think about here is after the superior cervical ganglion, you're traveling in close proximity to the internal carotid artery, as well as the cavernous sinus. So when you have lesions, third order neuron lesions, some of the things you can think about are internal carotid artery dissection, uh, probably or potentially the most sort of urgent of the etiologies of a Horner syndrome, as well as cavernous sinus pathology and some other things uh, mentioned here, uh, otitis media and varicella zoster. All right, so we've talked about each um, of the nerves in this pathway and some of the lesions that you can associate with them. Now we're just going to go through it all, uh, all together here. All right, so we're starting central up in the hypothalamus, traveling down through the brain stem to the spinal cord, into the intermedial lateral column of the spinal cord, of the spinal cord here, and around the T1 level, we're going to we exit. The this nice diagram was made by um, this person here. I'm just going to modify it slightly by putting a, a synapse here. This is the, at the end of the first order neuron. Now we're becoming the second order neuron traveling out of the spinal cord at roughly the T1 level up to the superior cervical ganglion. And you can see really nicely here how the superior cervical ganglion lines up with near the carotid artery bifurcation. And then we, after the superior cervical ganglion, become the third order neuron or the post-ganglionic um, neuron synapse travel near the internal carotid artery through the cavernous sinus actually pass through the ciliary ganglion, which is an important um, ganglion for the parasympathetic nervous innervation in the eye, but for the sympathetics, you just pass through. You don't actually synapse there. Um, and then you travel to the, the targets, the Mueller muscle and the, um, uh, the dilated pupillae muscle. You know, of note, we we're talking about the plus-minus nature of the anhydrosis, and to add that into our diagram, the um, vasomotor innervation just branches off earlier. Um, just branches off earlier um, in the pathway so that when you have um, third order uh, lesions you're, you don't get the anhydrosis because that the pathway is still intact. It happens, it happens before the superior cervical ganglion. Alright and so uh, going to sort of quiz style through each of the main lesions. So if you have a first order neuron lesion we're talking about here, right? that's all central so you think about vascular um, ischemic disease, demyelinating disease, compressive things like tumor um, or aneurysm um, in the central nervous system. Okay, passing from the central nervous system out of the spinal cord in close proximity to the apical pleura, taking up to the superior cervical ganglion. That's the second order of the preganglionic neuron, and the main association to make there is being near the pleura, lung lesions, pancos tumor, maybe head and neck surgery. All right, and then the postganglionic or the third order neuron is traveling here near the uh, internal carotid artery and also through the cavernous sinus. So the le lesions there can be cavernous sinus pathology as well as things like internal um, carotid artery dissection. All right, so uh, we'll move on and we're going to talk about moving gears now to how do you diagnose this. And the initial thing to think about is that you need to be concerned about a Horner syndrome and be worried that it's happening to then uh, take the steps to make a diagnosis and figure out um, the etiology. And so the, the way you become concerned about it is you recognize that a patient has ptosis, so you're thinking, wow, that I'm seeing a little bit less of the of the eye there, and there's some um, droopiness of the lid, then you see anisocoria difference in the pupil size. So when you see those two things, um, you may or may not see the third thing that's commonly thought of, the anhydrosis. And we said it's not present in the third order lesions, and that makes sense anatomically because of where the vasomotor um, sympathetics branch off is before the um, before the before the third order neuron. All right, and some other findings you can find um, is anisocoria that greater in dim light, and that makes sense and helps reinforce the pathophysiology about what's going on. So you turn the lights off, or turn the lights down, and what needs what will the what will the eyes do? They'll want to dilate. Um, but when you lose the sympathetics, you lose dilator pupillae innervation, and you can't dilate as well. So the difference between the pupils is accentuated um, by the dim light. 
there is said to be some small amount of dilation that does occur even in the Horner pupil that's lost its sympathetic um, innervation. And the reasoning, the way at least I've read it, is that you have uh, a relaxation of the uh, sphincter pupillae, which is controlled by the parasympathetic system, constricting the eye. And just by having that re relaxation, you get a little bit of dilation. All right. The other um, things you can see are the ptosis being mild, so a couple millimeters. You also see some slight lower lid elevation. And then things that can be associated with this are a transient increase in accommodation. So maybe the person would close one eye and hold um, a book that they're reading um, at a different uh, depth than, if, than, with, than with the other eye. That could be a way to see that. Iris heterochromia, which is seen in congenital cases, and then a lower <coughs> interocular pressure. And so the question here is, what about the light and the near reflexes? Should those, um, should those be intact? And the answer is yes, and that's talked about in a different um, talk about the parasympathetic um, innervation, which controls uh, primarily controls light and near reflexes. So they generally should be intact, even in a patient with uh, the Horner syndrome. All right, and so this diagram shows us the main features we've been uh, talking about. So the first thing we can look at here is just ballparking it. We see a little bit um, less of the eye there, so we could be concerned about the ptosis. And then the pupil diameter does seem to be somewhat unequal, so there's anisocoria. And it seems like on the same side that you have the ptosis, you also have uh, the smaller pupils, so it looks like meiosis and ptosis coming together, which should trigger, okay, now um, is there a Horner syndrome here? Um, what, you know, what, should we, what should we do about that? All right. The first thing that you want to do um, in, in the workup is establish that you do have uh, Horner syndrome. And so there's two different confirmatory tests. So these tests are saying, do you or do you not have um, Horner syndrome or loss of the sympathetic innervation? And the first one is the cocaine test. So the way cocaine um, works is that it blocks the uh, re the reuptake of uh, noradrenaline, so that you have more available to stimulate the alpha receptors and cause more uh, dilation. And so the idea being, for the Horner syndrome, when you put in the, c the cocaine drops, you have when you lose sympathetic innervation, you have a small or poor uh, basal release of the norepinephrine, so when you block the reuptake, uh, it doesn't have very much of an effect and you don't get uh, much of a dilation, whereas with the normal eye, you have uh, more norepinephrine being put out uh, by the sympathetic nervous system, so you block um, that reuptake and you get um, some dilation. The second one is um, aperclonidine testing. So this is another type of confirmatory test. The way it was discovered, I think, is kind of interesting. There was people doing some sort of like a glaucoma study. They wanted to see if um, the aperclonidine lowered the interocular pressure, and they were interested in wondering if it would lower the interocular pressure um, in the presence of not having any sort of sympathetic tone. So it was like a way to remove the confounder of sympathetic tone and see if the decrease was primarily caused by um, decreased aqueous production. They chose patients with Horner syndrome because they, they won't have sympathetic tone to start with, so it's a way to um, sort of eliminate that as a as a confounding thing when trying to figure out the etiology of how this worked. And what they noticed when they were putting these drops in these Horner patients' eyes um, is that they were dilating um, dilating the people's eyes. So they had the Horner syndrome, they had the meiosis, and they'd put the drop in, and they would uh, reverse the, the meiosis there. So um, just to go over how how these things work, you know, we're talking about a, you know a nerve ending then you have the synaptic cleft, and then on the other side, the, you have these alpha, you know, one receptors. And then when they're stimulated, they're going to cause the muscle to contract. And I guess this this thing I'm drawing here, I guess, is the muscle. Um, so the the cocaine, we know how that works. You have the norepinephrine, which can stimulate the alpha one receptor there. Um, the cocaine will block its reuptake. So that gets blocked and it can't go back in. Uh, so there's more available to stimulate the alpha receptors. And the the, um, the normal eye should dilate, um, but the horn, horn's eye won't really dilate very much because there's not a lot of norepinephrine in the cleft to begin with. So whether you block the reuptake or not, doesn't really um, it's not going to cause much more stimulation there. The apoclonidine um, mechanism, the way I understand it, is that you have alpha-1, you also have alpha-2 
receptors, right? And so the alpha-2 ones are presynaptic receptors, and when they're stimulated, uh, they actually decrease the release of the norepinephrine. So the uh, alpha-clonidine, like its name suggests, um, you know, clonidine stimulates alpha-2 receptors uh, primarily, um, and less so alpha-1 receptors, but it does, they do stimulate alpha-1 receptors a little bit. So when you give the patient, the patient with the normal eye, the, nor, the patient's normal eye, the alpha-clonidine, it's it doesn't it doesn't dilate. You have alpha one and um, you have weak alpha one stimulation, which is counteracted sort of by the alpha two stimulation, and you don't get any sort of dilation. However, when you give the Horner patient the um, alpha-clonidine, what you get is um, you have hypers sensitivity because you've lost the innervation to the muscle so these alpha-1 receptors become hypersensitive um, and when there's when they're when they're given um, when the apoclonidine is given it's it it is an agon it is an agonist of this receptor it's just a weak one but when they're hypersensitive when after they've been lost their innervation in the Horner syndrome um, then they respond to it enough to actually cause uh, a noticeable dilation and re reverse the, the meiosis seen with the Horner syndrome so the mechanism really depends on this denervation hypersensitivity um, that occurs with Horner syndrome and weak alpha agonism of the clonidine. All right, so the fir those first two tests, the cocaine um, and the uh, clonidine drops, they're telling you that do you or do you not have Horner syndrome. But you can also do a little bit more with the drops, and that's um, seeing or pharmacologic testing, that's a better way of saying it than the drops, and that's trying to see do we have ourselves a third order neuron or do we have um, a, a, neuron, a lesion that's pre-ganglionic, so first order or second order. And there's two types of drops I'll talk about here. And so the one is hydroxyamphetamine, so you put essentially drops of amphetamine um, in the eye. When the lesions are pre-ganglionic, both pupils dilate, and when the lesions are uh, post-ganglionic, the Horner pupil will not dilate. And this hydroxyamphetamine works the same way that just amphetamines do in general. And so what they do is you have uh, norepinephrine neurotransmitters in the nerve ending. You give someone amphetamine, what's it do? It pushes <laughs> it pushes the norepinephrine out, and then it can be active on the alpha-1 receptors, you know, across the uh, across the synaptic cleft. All right. If you have a third order neuron um, lesion, the, there won't be any norepinephrine here really to be released by the amphetamine and the Horner pupil won't dilate because this nerve will have sort of degenerated and won't, and won't be present there. Um, the second one listed here is the, I'm just giving adrenaline to the eyes, um, if you have the pregangionic lesions, um, neither pupil uh, dilates and if you have the postganglionic lesion, postganglionic lesion, uh, the Horner pupil um, will dilate, plus or minus uh, some improvement in ptosis. And again, the, inter the idea behind this is very similar to the, the clonidine idea. Right? So you give this concentration of adrenaline, is it enough to cause uh, stimulation, enough stimulation of agonism of the receptors and normalize to cause any dilation? But uh, if you've lost the uh, innervation in a postganglionic lesion, you get this denervation uh, hypersensitivity and uh, you should get some um, dilation of the eye, dilation of the, of the pupil there. All right, so now um, we're going to go back over this, the general pathway. Oops. General pathway. So the hypothalamus, then you have sort of complicated, unclear central regulation at the level of the anterior medial lateral column of the spinal cord. You leave, and the, you have a synapse there, that's what I'm talking about. You have a synapse at the IML of the spinal cord, and then you leave um, at around T1. Now, when you're leaving, you're a, a preganglionic pre sympathetic nerve. So at the superior cervical ganglion, you have a typical preganglionic setup. Um, acetylcholine, the cassandric receptor. Then you go through the, and the next third order neuron is after um, the ganglion. And so then you have your synapse there with norepinephrine, the synaptic cleft, and then you have um, the muscles that it's, that it's targeting.
in the alpha-1 receptors there. All right, and as a general uh, sort of knowledge note, we know that all the preganglionic, whether it's um, sympathetic or parasympathetic, use the same setup, acetylcholine um, and nicotinic receptor. And then for sympathetic nervous system in general, um, the, the postganglionic nerve, when it interacts with the target, um, will release norepinephrine. Um, but there's exceptions to this, and the, the two key exceptions to remember are one, uh, the sweat glands, they use muscarinic receptors, and then two, uh, the adrenal gland is a little different. It releases um, epinephrine and norepinephrine directly um, into the blood. All right. So to bring the work up together and summarize it, so the first thing you become concerned about a Horner syndrome when you see uh, some ptosis and anisocoria. The second thing that you do is do the pharmacologic uh, workup. Try to try to see if you can localize the lesion and confirm your diagnosis. And then you want to focus on how long has this been going on for. So once you know that you have a Horner syndrome, you want to say is it sudden sort of onset thing? It wasn't there yesterday; it's there today, or has it been there for months or years? There's some historical um, items that you need to ask about. So did the person recently have any sort of head or neck surgery or eye surgery? Have they had any trauma? And do they have a headache or associated neck pain? You do a typical um, head and neck exam, and then it, in, the, in the majority of the times, it's might, it probably won't be exactly clear um, what the localization or, and the etiology is. So then you have to do a workup, and the general recommendation is you, that you do <laughs> imaging of the sympathetic chain. So that would include MRI, MRA of the head and neck, and include CT of the chest, and consideration of uh, carotid angiography. An example of when you might consider not doing this have been, for example, um, someone had a head and neck surgery the day before, and then they have you know, this on, the onset, and you think, okay, this is definitely associated with um, the surgery. I'm not worried about something else. But in, in general, if you're not you know, super clear, and there could be something concerning like a carotid artery dissection, lesion in the cavernous sinus, th um, thoracic pleural tumor. Um, then you want to do the imaging to to work that up. And the treatment obviously is you can't really talk about because you're um, it would depend on what the under what the etiology is. So here is the best reference I found for um, this topic by uh, Timothy Martin. So you can PubMed that if you want to get a really more in depth nice review. There's also a good historical note here. Um, so the Horner syndrome itself was discovered by, a, or the reason it's called Horner syndrome is because there's a Swiss ophthalmologist who in 1869 wrote up a case of Horner syndrome. His name was um, Johann Friedrich Horner. Um, and then the thing I think that's interesting about it is earlier, prior to this, so in 1953, there was a French guy here who who also published, you know, the Horner syndrome essentially the same th the same thing, and it was you know prior to the to the Swiss publication, but for some reason it stuck as Horner Horner syndrome, and that's the way everyone I think pretty much learns it, um, except for in France because the guy who discovered who really discovered it first was French, and they sometimes call this Bernard Horner um, Horner syndrome. But anyways, this is, this is a good um, good reference if you want to get some more some more in depth reading, or you want to you know someone's asking about Horner syndrome and you want to email them a good article, it's a pretty good one. All right, and so as always, um, thanks a lot for watching the video. And please um, check out the, the website, um, visit ProcedureReady.com for more information. And if this was uh, you know, this, this stuff is all free and if it was useful to you, um, please consider checking out 52kids.org and making a donation, as well as the Aaron Michael Baum Foundation.org website, making a donation. So again, um, Thanks a lot for uh, watching.